everybody. This is Eric Apricot, and I'm joined by Perks from GSW Reddit. The preseason is going to start in a few days, so this is a great time to check in on the training camp roster. The roster consists of returning players that we know a lot about, like Steph, Andrew, Draymond, GP2, Looney, Kaminga, Moody. So those seven guys, we have a, a pretty good idea of who they are, and we have lots of hopes about how they might have improved for the summer. But we won't know that until we see the games. We're going to talk about the other guys, the young guys like Brandon and Trace, but then all the new people who've been added to the roster. So let's talk a little bit about Brandon and Trace. We saw them a bunch during Summer League. The Jemski and Jackson Davis both only got like a three game stint in. I think Brandon looked a lot more comfortable than he did last year, which was important for him. Obviously, he did play a full year in the NBA, so that kind of helps with that. But it's still good to see the second year guys looking like second year guys in summer league. I like the aggression Brandon showed. He was looking for his offense when he was playing, putting up some shots. The three ball was looking nice. So that was a positive sign from him. Brandon definitely was, was trying to be the point guard. He had the ball a lot and tried to set up people a lot. He couldn't resist, I think, going for a lot of highlight plays, which made it way fun to watch, but also yep. I think led to a ton of turnovers. Brandon, as you said, he's looking for a shot more. He definitely was better than last year because his last summer league was pretty bad. He, he just didn't have his shot at all. It was probably like 25% or something like that from three or 20. But it was really good to see him trying to play a different role and then also be a real standout in this setting. Uh, with Trace, is a great communicator defensively. That Draymond aspect of his game of being that leader defensively in that back line. And so yeah, I think we saw a bit more of that, which was nice. I would have liked to see him be a little bit more aggressive with his offense. I think for someone like him who has an established role already with the NBA team and is pretty effective at that role, summer league can be a good opportunity to try things that you don't normally have the opportunity for in the regular game, like maybe stressing the floor a little bit or showing off those post moves that he didn't call it. So I was a little disappointed we didn't see that part of Trace's game, but I think he still overall had a good summer league. Trace Jackson Davis... He played, what, four years in Indiana, and he was the man by the end. Yeah. He ran their offense through him, and so he's posting up a lot and taking shots. And definitely in the pros, that's not really his role anymore. I, I know that some of the staff have said they want him to grow in that direction, and I know that they wanted him to work on communication on the defensive end and then being a leader. I remember clips of the USA Select team just of him mic'd up. And just uh, yelling out coverages and where the screens are coming from and things like that. Watch it. I'm here. I'm right. Right shoulder. Left shoulder. You throw. Short. I'm there. Anyway, he looked like he was one of the better players on the court, and that's good. what you want. You want the, your second-year players to, to look so good that you, you don't really want to risk any injury after two or three games. I was at every Chase game, and the energy in the arena was so noticeably different when Trace and Brandon played that last game than it was the first two. It's nice to see those guys going from cheapest rookies trying to stake their place in the NBA to being with these guys who are recognized and prominent talents. I also noticed that a number of the other players in interviews talked about how Brandon and Trace were the leaders. Yeah, that's you know, very telling when you have two guys relatively young in age being looked in that light. So in the meantime, we also picked up some new people. We essentially turned Clay Thompson and Chris Paul into the Anthony Melton, Buddy Heald, and Kyle Anderson. I felt Anderson was a good fit for them. The way he plays just makes sense with how Kerr likes to run his offenses. I think he's going to be a nice fit. I don't know how much he's going to play because he is getting up there in age. But I would expect him to be like a part of that core eight. But you obviously have your five starters, whatever combination that looks like i'm guessing at this point that melton probably starts along with jk draymond and wiggins and obviously steph and then you'd have brandon and trace as your six seven and then i think anderson would be the eighth guy so i think he'll be someone who plays a lot very cerebral very smart he has a nickname slow-mo because of the way he operates offensively but it's just so effective and there have been games in the past both when he was a spur and when, when he was with Obviously, the Timberwolves recently where he was just killing the Warriors sometimes. And I felt like a player like that is just such a seamless fit on an offense like this. We've seen in the past that it's not enough for you to be a good shooter or be athletic like someone like Kelly Oubre, right? To play in the Warriors offense, you have to be cerebral and really understand how the pieces work together. 
Steve Kerr definitely was excited about that. Mm -hmm. He's talked about basically how smart Kyle Anderson and Anthony Melton are. My experience of slow-mo has been that he's just weirdly effective. When he's on the ball trying to create, it looks a little funny because he's got all these shifty changes of speed between slow and really slow. But he just somehow does manage to make it work competently on offense. And I knew he was a good defender, but advanced analytics love his defense. They think he's amongst the very top defenders in the league, which I hadn't really registered. 98th percentile. And you can see all the different ways that he's really effective. And then his passer rating, which is mostly based on, I think, assists to turnover ratio, but he's a really reliable passer. You can see him fit in a sort of mini Draymond way, being an excellent defender, the offense flow. There was this issue last year about him being a dreadful shooter. I believe he had some kind of eye problem and that was preventing him from shooting as well as in the past. And in the past, I think he never was a really good shooter, but at least he was competent. And this last season was a little troublesome. Yeah, I think that's really the only concern with him is he's never really been known as a spacer, as a guy who's going to knock in threes. He doesn't really take them at a high clip. He doesn't make them at a high clip. There was that one outlier year, the season before this season, where he was in like the 40s shooting for Minnesota. But before that, it's all been like sub 30, like high 20s. So in, in that sense, I think him and Draymond kind of share that issue of not necessarily being guys you have to always respect at the three-point line. But if he can at least knock in one out of three each game, some something in that realm, I think that will at least make up for the difference. But that if that's really the only concern, I think, with everything else he brings to the table, it more than makes us up for it. And so we should be expecting him to guard bigger guys. Like So historically, last year, it looks like he was guarding mostly at fours and threes and sometimes can switch up and down. So pretty versatile, but on the bigger side. Yeah, the Warriors usually size down everyone. If you were a power forward, you're probably playing center. If you're or small forward, you're probably playing power forwards. My expectation for Cal is he's probably going to be playing a lot in the second unit. I'm guessing we see both Trace and JK in those second units, maybe not always together. Again, it depends on the development of JK's three-pointer, if he can play that three role. But I would expect Kyle to play a lot of four in those lineups, maybe some three and maybe at, at times some five. But depends on how things work out. Let's talk about DeAnthony Melton. Melton was up on my board, but I didn't necessarily love the fit in Golden State. I felt like he overlapped a little bit too much to a GP2. So that's why I had someone like Kyle a bit above him because I felt like he was a better fit. But I do think Melton is, when healthy, just a really good player. He's a bit undersized, but he's a great defender, especially at the POA level. I think he rivals Gary Payton in terms of his ability on that end. We saw in that Memphis series against the Warriors in the championship year where he was just giving Steph and everyone else a ton of problems. On top of being a great defender, I feel like offensively, he's a good secondary playmaker. He's a good three-point shooter, just does all the little things offensively, moving without the ball, being in the right spots. Again, like Kyle, just another really cerebral player. So I think he fits really well on both ends of the floor for them. DeAnthony definitely has this reputation of being a ferocious point of attack on ball defender. Looking at these advanced stats, ultra elite in deflections and creating turnovers and, and just one of the very top analytics defenders in the league. And he has above average offense. It was interesting watching his highlights because he has a certain amount of hot dog to him, a certain mm -hmm. amount of, I don't know, like Jordan Clarkson, irrational confidence kind of game mm -hmm. that I didn't expect to see. I just think these really smart, talented defenders is really cerebral. And then suddenly to have him have a little bit of a wild side on offense is, is pretty interesting and funny. He had back issues, really hampered his game last year and mm -hmm. probably were a part of why the Warriors got him for cheaper than people expected. It's not like he has had significant health issues in the past, but if this is something that's reoccurring, but if not, I think it's a bargain signing for them at the non-tax pyramid level. For everything he can offer them, it just makes a lot of sense. And I think he will take a lot of pressure off both Steph and Brandon in that backcourt. Because, I mean, they're not bad defenders in either of them, but they don't necessarily offer what something like Melton can offer. And especially without Clay back there anymore, they need a guy who can do something on a defensive end. So I think Melton in that regard will offer them even more than Clay could, although he doesn't quite have the size to go against those bigger shooting guards. Yeah, just noticing his his height is officially here 6'2 and a little bit, mm -hmm. but his wingspan is 6'8 and a half. In theory, he can defend up a little bit. Like Blake Draymond strong guy. plays much bigger. Steve Kurt and Mike Dunleavy Jr. have been talking about being a top 10 defense as a goal. 
And so you can really see the attraction of uh, Melvin and Anderson. If you, you know, look at the roster construction, it's a team that has to hang their hand on defense because that's where you have the majority of your talent. Draymond's a great defender. Wiggins, when he's locked in, is a great defender. And then you have guys secondary positions like Melton and Peyton, and Anders, Looney, Moody, and JK too. And Trace, obviously, that's a lot defensively there. And offensively, you have Steph, and then you have JK and a couple other guys who can do some things. But if they're winning games, it's because they're holding opponents to less than 100 points. Right. Now for something completely different, let's talk about Buddy Heald. If you're basing your team on defensive strengths, you still need somebody to put the ball in the basket, and you really need spacing. And Buddy Heald became available, and the guy has poured in a a huge number of three pointers. You always see these statistics like he he and Steph have scored the most three pointers in the last n years. So he definitely gets it done volume wise, and uh, I think his efficiency is is good. But people always talk about the Buddy Heald experience, and I guess the way the Buddy he the Buddy Heald experience goes is that he comes to a team, and you think, wow, look at this guy. He's an athletic, he's a dead-eye shooter. If he just commits on defense and just learns a game plan, he's going to be borderline all-star. And then massive disappointment ensues when that doesn't happen. I think the easiest way to look at Buddy at this point is he's a budget clay, right? They lose clay, they need to make up for that volume of three-point shooting somewhere. So you bring in a guy like Buddy Heald who... I was not on the level of clay, but at their point of their respective careers, I don't know how big of a gap there is, at least in terms of the shooting perspective. I don't know if Buddy can really offer them much more than that. He's a great catch and shooter. He can create a little bit off the dribble, but in terms of creating for others to really having an impact defensively, it's just not going to be there from him. I would expect him to probably not be like a mainstay in the rotation, but a guy that They'll throw into certain lineups and certain game situations. If you're trailing in a game and you need to get some offense going, put Buddy Heal in there. And he'll definitely have some great games where he'll be like four or five from three and be a big part of them winning. And then there will be games where you're going to rip your head out when he's shooting 0 of 7. At this crafted NBA site, looking at Clay's stats, they have these player comps. And on offense, his number one comp is Buddy Heald. Yep. <laughs> Probably because it's the same kind of recipe. He does take a, a lot of catch and shoots. Also looking at Buddy Heald highlights, he creates a fair amount off the dribble. So that might be an interesting new wrinkle. And these analytics consider Buddy right now better than Clay straight up. About as good on offense and better on defense. For me, I feel like the key to surviving the Buddy Heald experience is I expect him to shoot above average threes. And uh, I don't need elite. I just need him to make a lot of open threes and to try on defense and not get too lost in the game plan. And I don't have a lot of expectations beyond that. Yeah, I would agree with that. One of the keys is going to be just how Kerr utilizes him. Because, I mean, we kind of experienced the Buddy Hill experience last year with Clay. Clay had some Ouch. awful games where he <laughs> should have been taken off the floor at points. And I feel like Steve left him in there. And part of that is Clay's pedigree and his familiarity with the system. And so because Buddy doesn't have that, I would expect if he's not playing up to standard, Kerr would pull him pretty quickly. So I think that would be one way to mitigate that. Wow, that is a, a harsh thing to say that Clay gave us the Buddy Heald experience last year, but I can't exactly argue with that. Maybe one way to think of it is, in some ways, Buddy Heald is a budget Clay, but maybe he's really a premium Nick Young. Oh, okay. I like that. Okay, so those are the, the big ticket signings, Melton, Heald, and Anderson. We have a couple of other people on the roster that are young and, and promising. So we just picked up Lindy Waters the third. He was For free, essentially. You mean because we got the pick back from Oklahoma? Yeah. Let's see. On draft night, the Warriors had pick number 52, and then they traded that to Oklahoma City for the rights to Lindy Water the third. And then Perks is saying it was for free because eventually the Warriors got the 52 pick back, but they paid some unknown amount of money, probably like $6 million or something, to Portland, I think. It was a little that. less. I think it... I have to check my notes, but I think it was around like 2.5 million. Oh, really? Okay. So it was actually announced how much it was. Yeah. So essentially, Waters costs what his contract is. I've been watching a little bit of film on Lindy. I was familiar with him from his time in the G League. And there was specifically one game against Santa Cruz where he just absolutely killed them. I think the biggest intrigue with him is his three-point shooting. He's a 6'7 six, 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 wing, has a little bit of size, and he shoots it really well. They're really high clip in the 40s essentially your 13th guy off the bench you can use in certain situations if you need a little bit more offense a little bit more shooting or if someone gets hurt like buddy for example 
to have someone like that, I think is useful. I think the biggest question with Lindy is outside of shooting, what else can he offer you on the floor? He can do some things defensively. He is good at rotating, getting into the right spots, but he's not necessarily an effective defender in my mind. And offensively, he does create a little bit of offense for himself and for his teammates, but I wouldn't really call him like an effective playmaker. Really, his biggest strength is his shooting, especially catch and shoot, movement shooting, running around screens. It's good to have one effective NBA skill, but I think to really be a useful player, we need to see if there's more to his game. Is Lindy actually signed to a strict minimum? So he's on a non-guaranteed minimum that guarantees on January 10th. So the Warriors have like a trial period until then to see how he fits. Maybe they bring someone to camp, someone like Kevin Knox can beat him out in camp. I still think Lindy has the inside track, but his spot is definitely up for grabs until that January point. I know Lindy Waters is a kind of cult hero in Oklahoma City fandom. I think he was born and raised in Oklahoma. He has Native American heritage, and he's just been a really good community guy. Hopefully, he'll be a fun player to to pull for and contribute. Do you have any comments about the state of Guy Santos? Yeah, I think Guy's a very intriguing player. I've been watching since his first summer league game two years ago, and I think he's shown a good amount of growth since then, especially for someone coming from the Brazilian league, which isn't among the most competitive. To see the level of growth he's done in the G League in the last two years. One game that I know Anthony Slater loves to reference, but it was that Brooklyn game where Santos was in the closing lineup instead of Clay. He was getting things done. He was part of the reason why they were doing well in that fourth quarter. He's a very cerebral offensive player. I think he knows how to pick his spots. I don't think he necessarily excels at any one thing, but I feel like he's a jack of all trades type of player or maybe like a master of none would be a better way to describe it where i think he can do a little bit of everything you handle the ball you play make in school or stretch out shoot the three do some things defensively there's enough in his game where you can see him develop into a really solid rotation he does have a certain power to his game he got this big body and it seems like he's been slowly figuring out how to harness it to get to the rim and to work it on defense and rebounding. And he even shot the three-pointer statistically well in his short time with the Warriors. So there's stuff you can dream about, but it's in this kind of awkward package too. It seems like he gets caught in awkward positions on the court. So there's definitely still a lot of room for growth for Guy. And I can imagine that there's a, a, a struggle to get Kerr's trust with that kind of play. Yeah, I think he definitely needs more development. So. He would be someone I'd imagine, obviously, with how deep this roster is, I don't think he'll play a ton with Golden State, at least to start the year. So I think we'll see him in Santa Cruz at least for part of the year, just to get those reps on the floor. I should mention that Guy Santos did play for the Brazilian Olympic team, and I didn't get to see that much of his play. But what I heard was that he looked competent, but wasn't a standout. And he did eat a lot of minutes that the coach did put him in for a fair number of minutes. Yeah, I watched a little bit of Brazil in the Olympics. I think my biggest observation was just the way they were utilizing Guy. I picture him as this power forward, small forward with the way Santa Cruz and, you know, the Warriors have been utilizing him, but he was playing a lot of minutes as shooting guard. Part of that is just Brazil both having bigger players and also a limited amount of spacing. So I think that kind of pushed him up. But it was interesting to see him matched up against other shooting guards who were a bit smaller than him. So I think that made things for him defensively easier. I think if he stood out on any part of the court, it was probably his defensive capability. And then offensively, taking open shots, crashing the boards, finishing around the rim, wasn't really hijacking the offense or playing outside of his role. While he did, wasn't a big standout, he started majority of those games. So it's good to see him be an effective part of a unit like that. We thought that coming into training camp, there was going to be a fight for the two-way contracts. Each team is allowed three two-way contracts, and Pat Spencer had signed a two-way in the spring. Okay. Reese Beekman signed a two-way on draft night. And then in the summer, right in the middle of summer league, Daquan Plowden was on fire, and the, and the Warriors signed him to a two-way. And that makes three, but then Quinton Post, who we just talked about, the Warriors paid several million dollars to draft. He was definitely going to get a roster spot of some kind. So we were trying to figure out who the odd man out was. We had assumed that the fight was between Spencer and Beekman because they had just signed Plowden. You were leaning towards them waving Beekman because Spencer had a more well-defined role that he could be called up to in the NBA as a point guard. 
And I think I was leaning towards Spencer being waived because he just was older and probably less likely to be picked up by another team. But then the Warriors zigged when we thought they were going to zag and they actually waived Daquan Plowden. I bet you have some thoughts about that. Definitely have some thoughts. When I saw that notification on my phone, I was shocked. Yeah, all summer, I thought Beekman was for sure the odd man out. Beekman is a young player. I don't know how much he can contribute. I think the only thing with him was if another team would potentially want to poach him. That's why I thought the Warriors had been waiting for so long to do this, to wait until every other team filled out their spots so they could sneak him in there. I for sure thought out of any of the three, the safest would be Daquan, just because the way he performed in summer league, he was so he was such a seamless fit in what they were trying to do. His ability as a 3 and wing, I just think he's a top-tier prospect and exactly the type of plug-and-play guy who's still young enough and maybe you can develop a little more into a rotational player that you want at a two-way spot. The CM get way to me, was a big shock. We'll see how things work out, but I would say as a fan, I'm not happy about it. I don't think that was a correct decision. I think there were many other ways they could have gone. One way that I don't think has been discussed and I didn't think they'd necessarily do it, but in theory, you could have actually signed Quinton Post to an Exhibit 10. Contract. And then obviously, they would have converted that to a two-way before the season, but that would have been a way to ensure that all four of them are at least in training camp. Now, that depends on Post and his representation agreeing to that, so maybe there was something they discussed and they didn't, but that would have been one way. Because, I mean, they did say after they weighed Daquan that they wanted Henry Cam. So... That would have been one way to achieve that. But even if that wasn't an option, I would have expected them to cut Beekman or Spencer before Daquan. So the fact that they went this route to me is quite a shock. Yeah, it was a shock. I think in some ways it's easy to explain in the sense that you could say, where does Daquan Plowden fit on this team? In order for him to get minutes, so many people would have to be injured in order for him to get on the court. All of the new guys could probably cover his role. Melton and Anderson and Heald in their own ways could take his minutes. Poor Moses Moody, always in the desert. He could definitely take his minutes. They Lindy need Waters. to trade that man. Let him play basketball. Yeah, I know we got a free Moses Moody. Lindy Waters probably ahead of him. So he'd have to beat out seven guys just to get on the court. So that's probably the most practical argument. But the counter argument that you're saying is that we're talking about the the 14th or 15th or 17th guy on the roster, maybe you just want to stash someone who's really promising and who could be really good in two years. Yeah, exactly. I get the roster construction standpoint, but at a certain level, you just want the best talents, right? Someone like Spencer Beekman, they can help in a pinch if you need point guard help, but can you find someone like Spencer on a two-way? I like Spencer, but I, don't, I think he's fairly replaceable. And if you look at the market, there's always an inefficiency for three and new wings. So I'm not at all surprised that Daquan got immediately signed to a deal by Atlanta after he was cut. I understand maybe the point was to have two point guards there because they do need help at that spot, but I just don't think this was a correct decision. Hopefully it doesn't bite them in the ass. Maybe it does if Daquan develops nicely. For his sake, I hope so. But yeah, I'm, I'm not happy about it. Rest of luck to him to Atlanta. He signed an Exhibit 10 there, so he'll at least start in the G League, I would assume, unless they convert him to a two-way. So maybe there's an opportunity for the Warriors to bring him back on a two-way at some point in the season if he's in the G League, but we'll see. This move would look a lot better if he ended up coming to training camp. But since Atlanta swooped him up, it, it looks worse. And it wasn't a shocker either because we had noted a couple weeks before that Atlanta had made a G League trade. They traded a player and a G League draft pick in order to get the rights for Loudon from Orlando. So they were poised to grab him if and when the Warriors did not sign him. Yeah, I, that was interesting when you mentioned that to me. I ignored it when I saw it because Orlando did end up signing that player, Robert Baker, to a contract. So I thought maybe it was just Orlando initiating that to get that player. But the draft pick going to them instead of to Atlanta was an interesting wrinkle. But the G League sometimes has weird trades like that doesn't make sense. But in hindsight, obviously, that was maybe an indication that Daquan's camp when you ahead and find that, hey, they're going to be cut. So they were looking for an alternative opportunity. And that's where Atlanta came in. So in our hearts, I guess we're really wanting to see what Reese Beekman and what Pat Spencer has to show in order to justify this. All right, Pat Spencer. So he was on the G League team last year, and then he got a two-way, and he played some random minutes for the Warriors last season. What were your impressions of his play? 
I would have liked to have seen a little bit more from him. It was a shame that he picked up that injury that kept him out for a couple of games. I think he ended up only playing four games total, I want to say. But in the time that we did see him, I think he did enough. There's a need on this roster as currently constructed for a third kind of emergency point guard. Historically, I've always liked to have someone at that two-way spot. Chris Chiosa comes to mind. Ty Jerome comes to mind. So I think Pat could definitely fill that type of role for them. It's interesting that once you said Ty Jerome, I spaced out. No, <laughs> that was very helpful. Just thinking about what the Warriors have historically done with their two ways. And he showed a good command of the offense, the way he was setting guys up, the way he was looking for his own offense. Defensively, he had some good moments, uh, especially hustling. There was a specific fast break up in that last game where he pretty much came out of nowhere to stop him from getting a very easy buck. Yeah, I remember that that super hustle play at the end of the Miami mm -hmm. game. Yeah. I think stuff like that definitely stuff the coaching staff loves to see. As a person, he has a very calm, reassuring personality at the same time. He definitely plays with the chip on his shoulder, which you can see. I think he's someone who fits their ethos very well and fits their play style pretty well. Pat Spencer, he's not bad at getting into the paint. Give him the ball, give him a screen. He'll either go away from the screen or use the screen and, and can often break the paint and then kick out to a shot. So he, he was actually creating offense in a reasonable way as a point guard. He also was involved in like weird bad plays. <laughs> and maybe it's yeah. just memorable because it's just like the end of the last game. Those last couple of turnovers were pretty brutal. But it maybe just be chalked up that hey, those guys have been going at it for two weeks straight. It seems if you give him the ball and just like an uncontested three, then he's actually quite good at just spotting up and shooting. So maybe it's natural to talk about Reese Beekman in comparison for someone like him summer league is a great opportunity to really stake a claim for a spot and when you don't get to play that makes things really tough but that first game i think he showed some things that were interesting that length that he has as a player some of the stuff he can do defensively and handling the ball there's definitely intrigue you can see why they wanted him on the team he's a really intriguing prospect and i agree i i felt like we didn't actually see all that much in game one so Reese Beekman statistically was really popping in college. His defensive stats were good. His assist rate was off the charts, just like percent of his teammates scores that he assists on. But I think a lot of that was the offense, like the Virginia offense just has a certain look. Like you just got Reese Beekman on the top and you got people running off a, a billion pin down screens. But nonetheless, he's clearly a decent passer. The college tape I watch, he's actually quite good at running fast breaks. But he just fits into one of my prejudices. He's six foot one and a quarter or something like that. And I just feel like it's really hard to make the NBA at that height. And I know he's got a really wide wingspan. I think something like six, seven. So he can defend taller than his literal height. But anyway, it's just a prejudice I had. So I did not think the Warriors were going to pick him up on a two-way. So I was really interested to see him in summer league. But... And in, in game one, it was just disorganized. It's not like people were really going at him defensively, so you couldn't exactly see him swallow guys up. On offense, it wasn't like a lot of pick and rolls for him. I think there are a couple, but for the most part, it was him running the flow of the motion offense. He made some nice passes and that there's some good plays, but then also he's trying to find his way. And then we just never saw him again. I think for a guy like him definitely needs a year in the G League. Okay. Quentin Post, he's someone that I'm a little attached to because I predicted that the Warriors would draft him. And so now I, I don't want to look completely stupid, but he obviously fills some needs that the Warriors have. Mm. They they need a big guy, but they also need a big guy who can shoot because as long as you have Draymond on the team, there's just a spacing issue. Post, uh, at least in college, was pretty great at running offenses. The, the Boston College offense more or less ran through him. They'd put him in the delay spot up top or in high post or low post, and people would run off cuts and screens off ball. So he just seems like a, a natural fit for the Warriors. Uh, so the scary thing is with the big guy is, is he going to be a stiff? Can he keep up with the NBA speed? Are people just going to be dunking on him or just treating him like a traffic cone on the arc? Can he keep up with game speed on offense? Those are all the questions going in. Yeah, and I, I don't know if he necessarily answered those questions. It's notable that he was coming off an injury that kept him out for a while. But the last two games we saw of him, he did look a little bit rusty and a little stiff at times. I guess we'll have to wait and see how he looked 
ex at least offensively. But the intrigue is definitely there. The shooting, the technique, the way those shots were falling looked nice. His ability to pass not only out of the low block, but the high post at the top of the key. And those are things the Warriors absolutely love in their bigs. So we'll see if stuff like that translates. I think it will. So you're thinking he might spend the time in the G League. I, I think that makes sense. That's more or less what happened with Trace. Quentin looked better than I expected in a lot of ways. I thought that on offense, he looked quite comfortable and decisive and maybe even a little too much. I remember when he first finally got onto the court, I think the very first play he was on, he started clapping for the ball from Pat Spencer. And it's kind of like, relax, man. The play hasn't even developed yet. What are you doing? But like, he just likes to have the ball making decisions while people are running off screens. There's like a particular play that they just kept on running for him where you got two guys on the wing and he's at the top. It's a pistol look. And then one person comes up and he can dribble hand off to that guy or he can dribble hand off to the second guy or someone can cut. And he looked super comfortable reading all of those situations. I feel pretty good about Post as like that offensive hub. And then as a shooter, you never know how it's going to really go at game speed, but you know, he shot it fine in summer league from three. And then on defense, I felt like he was often effective, but it wasn't like he's someone who's jumping around swatting shots. It's more like he's like a deterrent and he plays positionally. And I don't know. It feels like there's room for, for growth there. I'm curious if you have a player comp in mind for someone he could aspire to become in the NBA. I think Brooke Lopez, later Brooke Lopez, like someone who can space on offense and then on defense is a pretty decent shot blocker. Yeah, Brooke in his heyday was a pretty good post scorer. I didn't watch his ton of but in college. Is that something that's good? Well, post was asked to score a lot in college from the post. And mm -hmm. I feel like he was okay at it. There were a couple times in summer league where they threw him the ball down low. He had a mismatch, quick move, maybe not even dribbling, just went up and laid it in so like he he can do it but i don't feel like he's like a sengun who's gonna have a big bag of tricks and like lots of counters and things like that the warriors probably won't ask him to do much of that either way like, you know i don't know if it's this year or next year but mm -hmm. I, I think he's gonna be able to play curveball on offense it's just defense wise i don't even exactly have specific criticisms so for instance the way he rebounds is like boxing out like crazy and yeah. so he finds a big guy, he gets on him right away, boxes out. But then he often doesn't get the rebound. It's just, good luck, everybody. I did notice some of in the summer league games where you get in position and then or it's not enough in his hand. Yeah, so I feel like that's a, a coaching thing. I know Coach Decky, rest in peace, he had a whole thing where he trained Looney to box out sideways and not with your whole butt. You box out sideways with one arm, then you've got a whole other arm to grab the rebound. And that seemed to work wonders for Looney. Maybe there's a technique thing that can happen there with Post. And then on defense, he would contest a lot of shots. I feel like it was probably okay, but he wasn't exactly blocking shots either. Question marks there. All right. I, I think we should talk about Kevin Knox. He's now a, a cult fan favorite at Dub Nation. Yeah. You, people are talking about how can we keep Kevin Knox. So by that standard, I'm definitely lukewarm on him. But I know he was fun as heck to watch, and mm -hmm. he seemed to be a really good guy. He was drafted really high by the Knicks in 2018, and then I don't exactly know why he didn't stick in the big leagues, but then he got traded to, I think, the Pistons, and then they got waived, and then he just seemed to be out of the league. After that first summer league, if he played coming back from injury, I asked him if the other guys had been asking about his time from the NBA and asking for advice and stuff. And he was telling me how weird it felt for him to be called vet by all these guys who are pretty close to him in age, even though he's played six years in the NBA. He's been on four different teams. It hasn't really clicked for him yet. But I really like the attitude he approached summer league with. This is his first summer league since 2019. That's almost five years removed from it. But he said after that first game that he was coming in and he was going to do everything possible to compete and just prove that he belonged to me. And I think he did that. I think he played really well. I think he really fit within their team culture. Coach Vereen spoke glowingly about him every time he was brought up, said how much he loves coaching him, the resilience Kevin has showed so far. He even said that it's a shame that a guy like him has to play in summer league like he should be in the NBA. That first day that Kevin Knox came in, I think it was game two, 
So I was there and it was electrifying. First of all, I didn't expect him to play. I think the Warriors had yeah. said he had a leg injury. And so Scott was coming in instead. And then he was there. So it was like, wait, he's, is he playing? What's happening? And then he was hoisting up crazy shots and making chaotic plays. Uh, I always, in my mind, have a role on the Warriors called God of Chaos. And so for a while... It, that like, sounds it was, like JaVale McGee to me. Yes, yes. Okay, so it was Leandro Barbosa when he was... Oh, okay. And then he passed it on to JaVale McGee. And then Jordan Poole picked it up. So I don't remember if there was an interregnum. Uh, and Kevin Knox is very chaosy. Low probability things happen around him. The ball bounces in weird ways. He makes unexpected choices. So that first game, I remember at one point he took a three where the entire crowd groaned, gasped at the audacity of it. I, I was at that game. And let me tell you, there were people that were heckling him. They were, they were like, Kevin, no shoot that. Kevin, you suck. And I was like, man, for a summer league game, that's some intense, tense heckling right there. Yeah, yeah you're right. In my section, people weren't completely heckling him, but is what are you doing? Yeah. It was thrilling, though. Like, I, I, I loved watching him. And then the chaos went down every game. And by the last yeah. game, I thought he played mostly under control. And he poured in the points and he made the open shots. And he kind of kept the Warriors in that game. Yeah, without him, they would have been down a lot. I feel like at a certain point, they were more force feeding him that game because he was the only one who could really get it going. But that first game, I think, was a little rough at times. He had some air balls, a couple of turnovers. But the next couple of games he played, I feel like he really fit into that rotation and was like doing the right things, moving without the ball, making the right reads, knocking down open shots, rebounding, defending, doing all the things the Warriors like from their wings. And one of the big pluses with him is with his size, he can handle the ball pretty well. And the Warriors love wings to get handle the ball. As of this minute, he has no place on the roster because he's played more than three yeah. years in the NBA, so he cannot have a two-way. And the Warriors, as you sketched out earlier, they, they only have $500,000 under their hard cap, so you can't fit a minimum contract for him there. I'm assuming yeah. he wouldn't take a G League deal, but if he takes a G League deal, great. But he was in the G League last year. The only issue with getting him in the G League this year is that the Warriors don't have his G League rights. I, I have the sense that if the Warriors can keep him around, then they would just because he's so tantalizing. But I would think from his perspective, don't you think someone might give him a minimum once everything shakes out? I don't know about a minimum, but I think there's definitely teams that have more open roster spots. He could make the roster. Jackson Rowe, who spent last year in Santa Cruz, he didn't actually end up getting onto the summer league roster but because of that workout they invited him to try out in santa cruz that following fall and then he had that great breakout year in the g league and then came to summer league this year and now he's on an exhibit 10. jackson rose a funny guy i don't he's just somehow not really on my radar he's a good player hits open shots big guy it's like a three and d-ish kind of guy he's a good player but he just doesn't he doesn't pop is what you're he doesn't pop in a way that yeah. makes me think oh so Daquan passed him on the death chart, basically. And yeah. I feel like there are other Daquans out there. So nothing against Jackson Rowe. Obviously, much better basketball player than most people ever encounter in their lives. But yeah. I like Jackson a lot. I think he had a really good season for Santa Cruz. He's someone who actually reminds me of a former Santa Cruz player. I don't know how many people remember, but Ryan Taylor was a guy that people have been talking about for a little bit. Maybe as a potential two-way contract guy a couple years back, but that never really ended up working out. He's currently, I think, he played in Lithuania last year. Okay. Jackson shoots it really well. He's got a good size. I think he's going to camp on an Exhibit 10 contract, which does allow him the chance to be converted to a two-way. I think it's a very slim chance that that would happen, beating out any of these guys, Pat or Beekman or Post. But I do think he'll be back in Santa Cruz next year. I think he fits really well. He's a nice complimentary piece to have. I, some, I think in the G League, sometimes you just need a nice complimentary piece next to your development projects. They're not just paying with a bunch of other development projects. So right. he fits that mold. I just don't know at 27 if his chances of ever playing an NBA game are super high at this point. Probably not. Yeah, I hear that. I, I hope he makes millions of dollars playing in Europe. I hope good things happen to him. Blake Henson, he was in the Lakers system. They signed him, I think, undrafted. So Blake Henson is someone who did not have great analytics. And he is more of an eye test guy in the sense that he's a, a bucket getter. Like he, he just seems to be born to score and to make baskets out of weird situations and make difficult shots. Yeah, I saw him up close and personal when I was at 
California Classic and all of the Laker games he played. And he has that some real size. He's six nine, two something, but he looks like a boulder out there. So he's hard to move off the block. And that shooting stroke looks phenomenal. He looks like Carmelo with the way he puts the ball in the basket. In college, he was 38% from three and like over 800 attempts. I think his last year at Pitt, he shot like 42%, just blistering hot. But his catch and shoot, the range he has on his three ball, all look fantastic. My biggest concerns with him is he's a great shooter, but what else can he do on the floor? But we didn't really see a lot in terms of him creating for himself or for others defensively, if he can stay in front of his guys. If you look at his college stats, his assist to turnover 1.1 to 1.5 is not the best. Didn't really grab a lot of rebounds for someone his size, only four five for his career in college. Steals and blocks all sub one. So he didn't really put anything besides his shooting so far on the floor. So I'm curious to see if he can offer anything else and if there's room for him to develop there. One thing for me is despite his length and his size, his athleticism didn't really jump off the board. So we'll see, can he keep up with his guys? What does his screens look like? So it's all those little things is what I'm looking for in camp. But I would expect him to start the season in Santa Cruz. So we should have a ton of time to see what he can do. His defensive analytics also are, are negative, possibly because of his lower than average assists and steals. I remember in summer league, he wasn't very effective defensively. So that's my main area of concern with him. Shooting is a really important skill, but it's not enough to stick in the league. You have to be able to at least do a little something somewhere else. Kerr is on the wagon that you've got to be able to play both ends in order to get on the court. So it's hard for me to imagine Blake Hinson making the big team. I could easily see him going to Santa Cruz because he is very talented at scoring. All right, Perks, thank you for the check-in. There are a lot of little storylines to look forward to in preseason games and from the reports coming out of training camp. And I can't wait to check in with you a little later to see how the Warrior season is going and how the Santa Cruz Warriors season is going. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure.